Hey everyone, and welcome back to Beat the Sheet, an Xbox Game Pass challenge. The only podcast aiming to complete every single one of the 477 titles that have been made available on Xbox Game Pass since the start of 2020. As always, I'm your host Andy Wood, and I'm joined by my co-host Josh. And you know, I really don't think we need to really specify the number. That's really hurting my mental psyche. Oh God, that's a, <laughs> that's a frightening new addition to this podcast, let me tell you. All right, so on this week's show, Game Pass rubs our face in the dirt once more in Dirt 5. We go on the attack in Killer Queen Black, and we drop our shining pearls of wisdom about this week's Pokemon Direct and PlayStation State of Play events. So, Mm. how are you doing this week, Josh? You know, I'm doing okay. I'm doing fine. I've been playing a lot of that Persona 5 Strikers, as I threatened to last week. I'm about 15 hours in at this point, and yeah, that's a real good game. I like it a lot. It's like it's like hanging out with my best friends. It's like you, you just you just forget how much you liked those people compared yeah. to the people you know in real life. So you know, <laughs> frankly, I wish I was doing this podcast with Joker or Ryuji. Would it be even better still? But alas, you know, I'm stuck with you. So what can we do? Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I I also got Persona Five Strikers, but honestly, there's not even been a single thought in my mind about playing it because I just knew it wasn't going to happen. I just, it got delivered. <laughs> I got it out and went, oh, that's, that looks like a great, a nice game game box there. Let's put that on the shelf. And then, uh, and then I put it on the shelf and I played Xbox Live Arcade title Heavy Weapon, which is is complete garbage, let's be honest. But uh, but yeah, that's that's been a lot of my week. I did hit a good milestone, which was uh, I, I hit the big 300, Josh. I've, I've now completed 300 games on the sheet. So that's something. That, uh, I don't know whether to feel proud or just despair over that number, but that's that's what I've hit. It's a big boy number, let's be honest, 300. It, it seems like a lot, and then you announce you've got 477 titles to be, <laughs> and you realise that really it's just a futile endeavour, and you've still got like the entirety of the Yakuza series, most of Final Fantasy, all of Kingdom Hearts, yeah. Dragon Age, and oh. all of a sudden it just feels... <laughs> Utterly, utterly uh, hopeless. Don't, don't forget Bard's do? Tale, Josh. Never forget Bard's <laughs> Tale. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I considered for a while um, trying to maybe finish Final Fantasy VII this week. I thought, you know, that's a, that's a good game. That'd be a nice game to get my get my 300 with. But then I just felt like that wasn't in the spirit of this show. So yeah, I went for Heavy Weapon. In fact, I'm actually at 302 games now. I, I beat three games over the last two days which have a combined score on the sheet of 11 points out of 30. So just been beating some real trash. It's been great. Uh, you got you got to do what you got to do, don't you? I mean, I yeah. saw the games you ticked off as well. <laughs> they are all trash. Yeah. So kudos to you. They're, they're real bad games. <laughs> uh, they really are. Yep. You know, maybe we'll get to them on the show one day. But, you know, before that, guys, just, just don't play Dead Space Ignition. <laughs> this is all I've got for you. It's a very good advice. Words to live by. Let me tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Right then, lots and lots to cover this week, so I guess we should get rolling right into it. Okay, there have been three new additions to the Xbox Game Pass service this week, and they are Dirt 5, Elite Dangerous, and Killer Queen Black. So, another short, tidy little list, and on this occasion, perhaps not too much for us to play through, because we've got a couple of appearances of the fabled Nope games amongst mm. this list certainly yeah yeah this is this is a real nope list here so yeah i mean elite dangerous is a game that just has no there's no ending to that game i i searched far and wide on the internet to see what would be counted as an ending and you've just got people just saying well i've played a thousand hours and i'm still just flying around the galaxy so that's a nope that's not something we can beat and then uh, obviously killer queen black is an online only game so we're certainly going to be playing that but it won't be something we can officially say we've completed so yeah fairly easy week for us and you know i think it's a decent enough week for game pass as well like killer queen black is a really cool online game so always like when those games come to game pass and you know dirt 5 is a it's a big new release i I mean i'm surprised still that that's already in game pass so yeah not many complaints this week yeah it's a decent lineup isn't it dirt 5 is a big addition i i noticed it was going to come in i checked on the coming soon page on game passes site and it said it was a 75 gigabyte day, uh, download and so i thought well my internet's not gonna be able to get that done by you know next week let alone this sunday so i, I took the bold decision to just buy it on the playstation 5 and yeah that game doesn't run well on the ps5 but we'll get to that later more annoyingly still i checked back on the dirt 5 download once it had appeared in the store 
And it's only a 35 gigabyte download, which I absolutely <laughs> could have done in a couple um, of days. So I've been absolutely... Phil Spencer, you absolute pillock. You ruined me <laughs> on this one. What the heck are you doing? Uh, it is a fantastic shaft. And as you said, we'll we'll get more into the specifics of playing Dirt 5 um a bit later on. But you've you've had a you've had a tough run of things there. And I mean, I just love the because it's something that's came up on the show before and we sort of just brushed over it because to us it's so normal. But um it came up when we were talking about Final Fantasy 12 getting added. And it's just mad how normal it is to us to see a game come to Game Pass and then you just buy it because, because you're like, because <laughs> you're like, I'm not going to have time to play it before it leaves. And by the rules of this challenge, I have to beat it. So you're just like, oh, great, that's come to Game Pass. And then you spend money on it. It's it's a uniquely beat the sheet problem that we seem to just, we just brush over it because it's just become a normal part of our stupid lives. <laughs> it's an absolute <laughs> nightmare, let me tell you. But well, let's, uh, let's move on to some impressions. Let's talk about Elite Dangerous. You put a little bit of time into this. What did you make of it? This is a fabled old franchise, and this is apparently the most up-to-date and cool version of it. I don't even know what an Elite is, though. So why don't you fill us in on what you actually do? Yeah, okay, yeah. So this is a... I mean, it's quite an open-ended game, really. It's it's pretty much just a space sim. You you play as, as whatever you want to be to an extent. Um, you start the game with about a one-hour-long effectively like a driving test to be honest it's like here's your spaceship go through some rings learn how to like land and learn how to take off and stuff like that and uh and then they kind of just say right well you can do whatever you want and at that point there's just this huge galaxy to explore like like absolutely humongous i i don't understand how it's so big like i kept zooming out on the map and it just kept showing me even more planets it's it's nonsense so there's all that going on and then yeah you can choose whether you want to be like some kind of pirate man and go rob people or you can just be a trader and buy stuff at one place sell it at the next for a profit you can go out on like missions to like do some mining or like scan certain areas for people on request and yeah you kind of just do you know you just live a live a random space spaceman life in in space pretty much and do whatever you want so there's a there's a ton to this game. I think it's a uh, for someone who is excited by the prospect of that. This this looks like a, a just a massive like great pickup for Game Pass for those people. But I was just a bit overwhelmed. Like I can't lie. I mean, there's just a lot going on here. Like even the first planet I landed at. Like not only is there like the market with all the different prices for stuff, but then every planet has like a ruling faction that rules it at the moment, and I think they can change. And then it's got like an economy rating to say how good the economy is on that planet, a security rating to say how well defended they are. So I guess maybe you can take them over or something. It's 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 wild. They're, this is a huge, huge, scary game. Uh, but as I said, if, if this is what you're after, there, there could be some really good stuff here. I mean, my main thought when I looked at this game was how much like previous Xbox uh, Game Pass title ever space is it like? Because mm. we mentioned on the... Uh, the uh, the sheeties, I believe, I gave out an award to ever space has been just an s- absolute pile of trash, and <laughs> yeah. I completely hated it. Mm. Is there any ever space vibes to Elite Dangerous? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, ever space is is basically a it's a roguelike where they forgot to add in the content, right? It's just it's just <laughs> it's just ten rooms of blank space, and then if you get to the end of them, you manage to to win. So no, this is this is very much a different different caliber of game. This is a huge simulation type thing there's tons going on it it probably falls into another category of game you don't like which is the job game because this this is just a game of you doing a job you know it might be in space but you're just working you're just doing work there's not you know there's no big like story dragging you from place to place there's no you know big evil threat you're going to be beating this is literally just you're in space i guess i'm going to be a trader and make a bit of money that's that's what this is so you know some people love job games and if you do then Try it in space. But uh, as as we said earlier on in the show, this is thankfully a nope game because there's literally no end to it. So we're, we're saved from it, which is is nice. I, I don't quite fancy it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can safely say this isn't my bag either. But for those of you who do want to get a job as some form of space cowboy, making deliveries across the universe, trucking convoys and all that jazz, I imagine you can have a good time here. But yeah, this it's a job game, man. You know me. I, do, I don't yep. like working in my games. I like playing my games. I don't like to do a job in them. So let's move on to our next big game of the week, and it is Dirt 5. Uh, before we get into it, let me issue my disclaimer here. So as I <laughs> mentioned, I did buy a retail copy of this game. I did buy it on the PlayStation 5. Uh, I'd read about crashing issues on the PS5 version before buying it, 
but it seemed like they'd been resolved. So I felt like, okay, I'll pick it up. It won't be a problem. Unfortunately, the very day it was delivered to my door, they they gave a new patch to the game, a new update to it, which brought back all the crashing issues they'd managed to fix on the PlayStation 5 with gusto. So basically, I have managed to play through this game, but on the PS5, it has a horrible habit of deleting all your save and sending you all the way back to the beginning just for these shits (laughs) and giggles, basically. It's, It's a real technical disaster on the ps5 Mm. it's a real problem the crashing issues are a huge huge problem so in terms of that version of the game i'd give it a four it's do not play this game on playstation 5 fortunately i've played the game i know how the game plays everything else plays the same so i'll review it and pretend we didn't have these issues and that i was playing the game pass version of it so that you know it's a balanced review for this show. So why don't you kick us off though and tell us what you made of this? It's not like we've not played enough dirt games recently. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. And I, I kind of agree with the sentiment that you said there as well, because the, the Game Pass version is absolutely fine. So that's worth that's worth saying right out of the gate. There's there's no crashing issues, there's no save data loss. So if you are coming to this from a Game Pass standpoint, as as most of our listeners are, then yeah, don't worry about that stuff. But but yeah, so here we are, Dirt 5, even more dirt. We've we've done a lot of this lately. But I guess to, I mean, to either give them some credit or to kind of drop a bit of shade on them, it doesn't feel like I've played this game before because they seem to just reinvent what Dirt is every time they make one. Like, I, <laughs> I this isn't the same game as Dirt 4. Like, I was actually looking forward to this because I enjoyed Dirt 4. And while I think this is a good racing game, I was disappointed that it seems to have just shed almost everything about itself to become a totally new game here this is a game that is very very focused on its kind of off-road racing there's you know most racing events have you going over like dirt tracks and jumps Uh, you're even on ice for a lot of races whereas you know dirt four was by and large a traditional rally game you know the one the main game mode i would argue in that one was rally events and stuff and there's basically none of that here you won't get any any rally events here so if you do enjoy that you're, you're not getting them here the only the only timed event in this is something where you're in some crazy contraption trying to go up massive hills against the clock. So that's certainly not rallying. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, getting away from that, this is a very, it's a very good racing game. Um, I think the racing itself is some of my favorite racing I've done in games, actually. I, I think it controls really well. It's got a fun arcadey kind of handle into it. Uh, it's got some really good, like good visuals to it, particularly the weather effects. I think the, it's, this is such a specific thing, but I think this game has the best rain on the floor that I've seen in a racing game. <laughs> it has such good rain on the floor. It looks amazing. Um, so, you know, got a lot of good stuff about it there. Um, although in the end, I did end up a little disappointed by the fact that it, it's, you know, shed those dirt four roots. Um, and also the fact that I just, I just didn't feel like there was enough variety in the events. I think they pretended that they had all these events of different types, and yet I feel like most of them were the same. So, yeah, that's my kind of big pitch of views here. How did how did you get on with it? You see, I quite like Dirt 5. I liked it because it has completely, as you mentioned, shed its valley influence to become an arcade racer. And I like arcade racing games. So already you were off to a good start with this game for me. I don't mind the loss of what came before. And in many ways, off-road racing games, there's not as many as there used to be, to be honest. There's... You know, the days of Motor Storm have completely disappeared. Yeah. Forza Horizon has it to an extent, but that's quite track heavy as well, at least road heavy in the way that you get about the game. So there's not much of this genre about anymore. So it was quite nice to have something new to play within it. And you're right, the cars handle pretty well on the whole. There's a few very noticeable exceptions. I said the sprint events where you have these cars with a giant spoiler on them, which just completely is glued <laughs> to the wall. Like yeah. it's just it's like the wall is made of magnets and you just go flying towards it no matter what happens. Never got it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as I said as well, they they try and really sell you on the idea that these modes are different. Like every time you press on a new game mode type for the first time, they'll play this audio from um the the, the game has like a fictional podcast, which is fairly well done to give us some credit. And they'll have the people in that talking about what makes this event different. And you know, they'll do that for all of the eight or nine different types of event, maybe. 
but I would say about six of those events are the same event. So they'll they'll try and tell you the difference. They'll be like, oh, this event's all about getting some big jumps on the mud. And you're like, yeah, that's that's what I did in, in Rally Raid and Ultra Cross and Rally Ultra Cross Mix Super. Like they're all the same bloody thing. So yeah, that's a bit frustrating. And also that sprint event you talked about with the car with the massive spoiler. I have to say that is literally the single worst racing game event I've ever played. Like, there's not even a question. It is the absolute worst event. This is a game where I was winning pretty much every race without any trouble. Like, I, if anything, I probably should have tweaked the settings above medium because some races I was winning by about 15 seconds. It just probably, I probably should have ramped the difficulty up. Those sprint races with that big spoiler car, I turned the game to maximum driving assists, put it on very easy, and... After about 50 goals, I managed to scrape like a 7th out of 12. But every every other time was just in the wall, last place. I just, I don't know what that event is and I don't quite know how it scraped through QA. So yeah, if you get to that event and you're playing this game, do be aware that you don't need to win it. Like you can just play it and move on. So yeah, don't be an idiot like me who feels the need to stick at it for about an hour and a half trying to beat it because you just it's just going to cause you, you're just going to have a bad time. Yeah, it, it's a pretty bad event, isn't it? We should talk about the career mode. It's set out in quite an interesting way. You basically have an endless series of branching paths mm-hmm. of which you can complete as many or as little races as you want. There's ostensibly a star target to get to, but it's so low that you couldn't really fail it even if you came last on every event. They're really easy targets to attain, which I kind of like. It's probably a good thing. But the main thing you mentioned is this podcast they used to frame the events and frame the story which they tell, which is essentially an upstart driver hired by an old legend who to join his company of, you know, car weirdos. And there's some jerk on the scene voiced by Nolan North, because of course he is. Yeah, Everybody is voiced by Nolan North. He's going to take over a view on this show in about five minutes time. <laughs> and we won't even have any say in it. But he turns up as well. And you know what? I actually quite like this. I like the yeah. way that the podcast tells a story, but you can just skip it if you don't want to listen to it. It's not doing any weird video playing for nonsense jerks, just handing around <laughs> drinking in sports bars or something like that. It's just very grounded, very real. It kind of feels like something that's actually happening. It makes me feel like I'm in yeah. a sporting community where all these weirdos love these dirt events for whatever reason. And this podcast turns up every three or four minutes. The coasts are pretty funny. Some of the jokes are all right. It's pretty well written. I actually think this is a really clever way to make a story fit a racing game. Because let's be honest, it's not a genre that really suits telling a story. And yet, I think this is about as good a way as I've seen it done. Perhaps my only main criticism is that when you have a three or four, sometimes five minute podcast, and all you could do is sit on the menu listening to Mm. it, it's a little bit of a strange way to interact with an interactive medium. Is me just sat there doing nothing, thinking... (laughs) Should I go now? Or do I just yeah. keep listening? So maybe no, a that's... better way to in, to put it into the game would have been the key here. But other than that, I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, and no, I agree with that completely. Um, you know, I was initially a bit taken aback when I saw that, you know, uh, well, Dirt 5, a racing game, had the voice talents of Troy Baker and Nolan North playing the two leads. Because despite the fact they're in, you know, realistically every game, they're they're big ticket voice actors, right? I mean, Troy Baker's Joel from from Last of Us. Nolan North is literally every character you've ever seen. So, <laughs> you know, like I was I was like, that's that's pretty crazy. But to be fair, they they do a really good performance because of course they do. I I, I actually love Troy Baker as the kind of aging mentor that, that leads you, you know, through your kind of rookie career. I think he does a really good job because of course he does. He's really good. But um yeah, I agree. Really good setup. It's nice that it's just completely passive in that you know you can skip this if you want you will not miss a thing you know you just you just you if you want to just gun through the races and just press skip and the podcast shows up you don't really lose anything you know it's just a story of you know you're the rookie coming up and you're gonna try and beat this 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 kind of new bad boy guy who's who's at the top of the scene you know it's it's simple stuff but it's it's well delivered so i i do like that i also like the fact that this game is a wash in color it's a real mm. colourful game. I like that a lot. There's party poppers streaming everywhere for absolutely no reason. The <laughs> colour palette of its actual, even just its menus are just swashed in colour. You can pimp your car out to have loads of cool little designs and paint jobs and weird sponsors and weird logos you can give yourself. I got to call myself McFast Pants and everybody <laughs> would refer to me as it, which I kind of love. Nice. <laughs> a lot of just weird fun presentation side to dirt five as well it has a lot more personality than dirt four did for example which was a little bit stale 
I, I know a lot of people didn't care for this game moving away from its rallying kind of roots. The, there is a rally mode, but now you're racing against people, which kind of means it's not really rally. It's not rally, yeah. It's just, it's just a long race. But I, I kind of like it. I kind of feel like separating Dirt, the actual main series, and Dirt Rally from itself is probably a good idea. Because mm. we both said it when we played Dirt 4. At times, it, I didn't know where it was sitting. Like, what did it yeah. want to be an arcade racer? Did it want to be a rally game? It was kind of hard to tell. Whereas this game is unabashedly an arcade racer. You know, not too many laps, not no 17-lap monstrosities. Most things are kept to three or four, which I like a lot as a way yeah. to just jump into races. Yeah, I, I like what they've done with this game. I, I wish it worked on the console <laughs> I played it on. Of course, yeah. I, I like a lot of what this is. No, that's fair. I think my my worry really from them stepping away from Rally is that, you know, we've we've had to play Dirt 4, Dirt 5 and Dirt Rally 2.0 in Game Pass now. And I love the rallying in Dirt 4, but I hate the rallying in Dirt Rally 2.0. It's just, it's too simmy. It's too easy to just ruin your race and fall off the track and you end up damaging your lights and you have to race at night and you can't see. And, you know, I, I do want them to still make some kind of arcade tint on a rally game. I don't want it to just be hardcore rally or whatever the hell dirt five is you know it's it's a shame i feel like we're missing something there but but nonetheless it does have a it does have a hell of a lot more personality than dirt four that can't be denied this is as you said just a game full of just vibrant colors and and stuff and that's great and uh while we're on the uh the naming thing what was your what was your name again mcfast pants nice that's a good name so yeah there's a bunch of just wacky names you know it's just typical stuff like the master or reaper or, or fastball and stuff like that so i was scrolling down the list to try and find the best name and um i ended up going for a name which is really a tribute to a a legend of our past past life josh our, our past friendship so um quick story time here we uh me and josh used to always do a, a weekly pub quiz when we were when we were at university and the reason we did this pub quiz was because if you came second last so you weren't an absolute loser you came second last you got free beers and we sucked but you know we could often get that second last spot and the reason we could do that is because a man would show up at the pub on his own called colin and uh, in in and amongst all of these crazy names that you could pick for your character on Dirt 5, I found just Colin. And I was like, you know what? That's that's what I'm going for. So, yeah, so those podcast people on mine would just be like, well, how about that Colin? He's, he's, he's doing real good racing now. And <laughs> that's me. I'm, I'm Colin. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the free pints, Colin. You are now immortalized in my Dirt 5 game. You've, you've got to love it. If you was anything really like Colin, <laughs> you'd have finished dead last in every race. I guess that's why you tried that sprint mode about 50 times. That, yeah. was, that was your tribute. Just keep coming last, going straight into the wall. <laughs> Not too dissimilar to Colin after he'd had too many Guinnesses. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, yeah, no, good good choices. Some really fun names in this yeah. game as well. I really I really do like some of that stuff. I mean, the music's really good too. I mean, mm. this game's got a great score. It's got a load of fun uh, indie pop acts, but also a weird Shaka Khan song out of absolutely nowhere. <laughs> absolutely love that. Like the mm -hmm. fact that as you drive past houses in this game, you can hear people blurring out that song. And so sometimes it comes <laughs> yeah. across the sound really clearly. And then as you drive away, it fades back into the background. Absolutely mm -hmm. love that. There's just a lot yep. to like here. There really is. It looks real good. You know, now that it's, you know, been patched up a little bit as well as a little shaky on launch, but apparently all versions look pretty decent now certainly they did for me i, I yeah, like I this game I, I think it's a pretty fun time and you could get through the actual career if you just mainline it in all of six to seven hours play most of the modes play jim carner which is the stunt racing version <laughs> once and never play yeah, it never again, play it again it's, yep. it's no fun <laughs> but other than that yeah i, I think this is pretty decent I, I like it a lot no no that's very fair and i think uh one thing as well to touch on quickly because it's one of the coolest things this game does is um in a lot of the races that are like free laps, they'll make a real point of drastically changing the weather as you get to mm. the later laps. And I think that's really clever. Like you'll you'll have a race that starts off in the in daylight and then by the last lap, it's like pitch black and snowing. And you've kind of, you know, you've almost got to use the knowledge you learned from the first couple of laps of the course to help you get around in that in that dark lap. And, you know, sure, it's kind of wacky and not particularly realistic that, that stuff changes that fast, but it is, it is cool. It is really fun. So... Yeah, I, I do quite like this game. I, I was kind of sitting between a six and a seven for this as I played it because I do think that when it misses the mark, it does miss. Like, you know, as we said, that that sprint mode is is poor and the um the Jim Carner thing is is pretty dreadful. 
Uh, even the the Pathfinder one where you try, try and climb hills, I felt like there was about two courses for that and the event came up about eight times. So that kind of irritated me. But when you are just doing some some normal racing, it is one of the, the most fun racing games to play out right now. So, so yeah, I'm going to come out at a seven on this one. I, I do think it's worth a look. Yeah, I'd probably give this a seven. I'd maybe even give it an eight. I think it's a pretty damn good game. As you mentioned, there are a couple of weak modes. I could never play Pathfinder because that was guaranteed to crash my console. Every ah. time I finished <laughs> Pathfinder, then it would crash. So I only ever played one of them. But <laughs> other than that, I think there's a lot to like. I think it's a pretty damn good racing game. And yeah, if you're not sick to death of playing dirt games, like we kind of are over this past couple of months, I think there's a lot to like here. It's definitely one to keep on your console. The playgrounds mode as well, just to give it a quick mo- a quick shout out. Loads of crazy things are getting created in that as well. So there's loads of fresh content coming in, which is pretty cool too. So it seems like, again, that's going to keep giving stuff to its audience. So yeah, shout out to Dirt 5. Just don't buy it on the PS5. For the love of God, don't do it. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to our next game, and it is Killer Queen Black. Now, we mentioned this is a note game. It's a game we can't complete for the sheet, but fortunately, I've already played a lot of this because I owned it on Switch, and Andy, you've played a little few matches of this over the past couple of weeks as well. So mm-hmm. this is a multiplayer-only title, and I would go as far as it's possibly one of the best multiplayer games ever made. <laughs> so let's, let's, give, let's give you that to jump off of. It's just yeah. tell me I'm an idiot. No, yeah, that's that's pretty fair. This game is wacky nonsense, and yeah, it's 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 absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, let's try and let's try and make sense of what this game is to people because it's it's a difficult one to describe. I think this is kind of a four versus four platformer slash combat multiplayer game mm. with with just three completely different ways to win each round, and I think that's the key hook that works so well with this game. So. You can win each round by basically either collecting these berries and storing them at your place. It's like, you know, once once you get enough of them to your place, you win by like an economic victory, they call it. Uh, you can win a military victory by killing the other person's queen, which is like their best kind of fighter person three times. Or in a fantastic third mode of victory, there's just a big ugly snail in the middle of the arena and you can jump on the snail and slowly race it towards your goal on your side of the screen. And if you get the snail to the end of the, the, the screen, then you win the snail victory. And and that's the game. You just you play four versus four matches and you just try and go down one of those angles to win to win the game. And it's just so, so satisfying to do that. There's such a constant intensity about playing this game. Cause you know, you might you might be pushing for the snail win, but then you realize that. The enemy queen has, you know, only got one life left. So maybe you pivot and try and take them out before they they do one of their victories. And I just, I absolutely love it. I can't say enough good things about Killer Queen Black. I think it's fantastic. Killer Queen Black does so many things right. But the main thing for me is that all of the action is on one screen. You can see everything. There's yeah. no panning around. Everything is visible to you. All eight players, and it's always an eight player match, are visible. You can see what they're doing. And the key is to make sure you're not too wrapped up in your plan to not notice what other people are doing. And it's incredibly, incredibly clever. And the way it lures its mechanics as well. You know, the queen bee, for example, could power up the drone bees so they can do other things better. But at the same time, if they keep doing it too much, it leaves them open to attack. They need to keep nimble. They need to keep moving. The snail victory, which, by the way, potentially has my favorite animation in all of gaming. (laughs) I love the look of the drone bee as it rides the snail. (laughs) <laughs> it is beautiful. It's absolutely fantastic. But the queen needs to kill that fin to knock them off. You can throw yourself in front of the snail, though, to slow it down, which I love. The snail will yeah, eat you. It will just if slowly you throw eat you. In front of you. <laughs> that is beautiful game design. Just fantastic. And it, the big hook as well is that nobody knows who is going to be the queen. You mm. don't decide it. So if you're not particularly good at it, you're shit out of luck if you get caught up doing it. You're going to have to play that role. You're going to have to do it. And I love that. I love the fact that you can't just have four people who are good in one particular role. You kind of all have to be good at doing a little bit of everything because you all need to be able to pivot at a moment's notice Mm. once you notice that there are only three berries away from an economic victory. So you need to go hard as nails on the queen to try to kill them as quickly as humanly possible or the snail is sneaking to victory. But you only need two berries. Do you stop the snail or do you try and get the berries? It's decisions and it's decisions made all the time, constantly, and it's all happening in front of you. And yeah, you can tell this game came from the arcade. It's got arcade all over it, as all the best multiplayer games tend to do. 
this is a game where I know we can't have friends around at the moment, and that's very sad, but this is the ultimate party game as far as I'm concerned. You could not have a better party game than this. Hmm. If you could get eight players to play this game, my God, you would have the best time of your life. It's so much fun. Brilliant, brilliant game. Yeah, absolutely. And even, I mean, you know, obviously getting eight people together might be a challenge and I suppose even getting four together is, but if you can get four people together, you can all jump in to an online game as your team of four and just play other people online. And I love that as well. I think that's great because, you know, why not? It all takes place on a single screen. There's no point limiting, you know, how many people can jump into an online game. So, you know, yeah, I've jumped into a few online games where it is clearly just one game attack and like his free guests playing against us and i just think that would be so incredibly fun like i can't wait to play this game with some people in a local setting i just think it's going to be like so much fun and it's a really easy game to pick up as well there's it's deep it's deep as hell you've got to you know learn the system to what the game is doing but you can pick it up pretty quickly you can actually gain the general gist of what you're going to have to do very simply. It all controls very smoothly. The pixel art is gorgeous. There's a lot going on, which is just fantastic on face value. It has a real good tutorial as well, which does just teach you all the mechanics. And then it's up to you to start putting them into practice. There's just there's so much to enjoy here. Yeah, this is a real good game. Probably the only real downside is, is that it's never found an audience. The audience on Switch is dead. Dead as a dodo, you're going to struggle to find many games. I'm hoping that Game Pass will give it an audience on this platform because it deserves one. It really does. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with that. So I I jumped into this a couple of days ago and I, I did the tutorial, which I agree is, is great. That only takes about maybe 20 minutes and it just jumps you through like eight or nine different scenarios that teaches you every aspect of the game. And yeah, really good, well worth doing. And then I jumped into um, ranked matches. Now there is a quick match option, which I didn't try. So maybe quick match will be more efficient. But when I jumped into ranked matches, it was taken on average kind of two, two to three minutes to find a game, which, you know, that's that's a bit long because, you know, you don't actually spend too long playing a match once you're in it. I mean, it's a best of five series. So if you win three times, you you win the round. But games typically only last from anywhere between... 40 seconds maybe to two minutes i guess i would say like there's you know they can be quick if if, you know if one team has an overly aggressive queen that just gets itself killed it's really quick but yeah it's quite a short game to play so you don't want to be waiting three minutes between matches that's too long but again maybe quick match will be better and i just hope that it just picks up now that it's in game pass you know i i would implore anyone who listens to us to absolutely download this game i just think it's it's so much fun to play it's well worth checking out even if you don't normally play online games that often i even i mean i don't play a lot of online games anymore i'm, I'm too busy playing garbage game pass games to, to get to 302 completions but even i put aside a good few hours this week just to play this because it was so much fun it's it's great yeah, I mean, we don't score games, which are noped, unfortunately. But if you were to ask me for a score, I'd say it's at least a nine. It's yep. pushing a 10. I think it's nearly perfect for what it's trying to do. I, I don't say it lightly. I think it's one of the best multiplayer games of all time and is very much worth people's attention. And if you can ever find, if somebody tell me if you can find me the old arcade cabinet of this game, <laughs> just tell me where it is so I can go. I've never had the joy to play this on an arcade and I would love to. So yeah, let's let's hit us up in our comments anywhere you can find us and tell me where there is a cabinet of Killer Queen because I would love to play it. Yeah, I I will join you in that. We will once once we can travel, we will travel to that cabinet if if, if that is at all reasonable because that'd be incredibly fun. And yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I I'm leaning towards a nine out of ten for this, but realistically, that's just because I don't know. I, I think I'd need to put more time into to really be sure of a ten, but it basically does nothing wrong. So, you know, maybe it would end up at a 10. It's, it's yeah, fantastic stuff. Okay, let's move on to our leaving soon titles. And at time of recording, we don't know what they are. All the games which were due to leave left on the 28th of February. Uh, we did review all of these last week. Uh, they are Jackbox, Party Pack 4, Momodora, Reverie Under the Moonlight, Oxen Free, and Van Brace Cold Soul. So, As mentioned, we spoke about this on last week's podcast. Do give them a listen if you want our thoughts. You won't be able to play them on Game Pass, but you could buy them if you wanted to. Uh, To give a quick line on that, I wouldn't buy any of these games. (laughs) Maybe Jackbox if you really want a party game. But other than that, I I thought this was a pretty poor week of leaving soon games. Maybe Oxen Free. 
at a push at a cheap mm. price anyway that's fair i'd 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 say yeah pick a box and free particularly if you see it on a sale uh maybe on the switch as well the switch is a great platform for that game so i'd keep an eye out for sales for oxen free but i don't think you're missing anything by not playing the rest of them um uh, but yeah so that's that's leaving soon for now uh, if you want to get the first look at the next batch of Leaving Soon games, we will be posting about them on our Twitter as soon as we know them. So, yeah, feel free to follow us um, at Beat the Sheet on Twitter and we, you can see those as soon as we know. All right, then. So it's a busy, busy week of news this week. We've obviously got the Sony State of Play and the uh, smaller Pokemon Direct with a couple of big Pokemon announcements to cover this week. But before we get to those, let's cover a couple of smaller stories. So opening this up, then we have heard from EA that they are officially pulling the plug on Anthem as a game. They are giving up on it. It's it's done now. And uh, yeah, that's it. So this is a, I mean, it's hard to say this comes as a shock, but they did announce in May last year that they were basically stopping making any small updates because they were working on Anthem Next, which was going to be this huge scale, complete revamp of Anthem. You know, they were desperate not to give up on this one. They they thought there was something there that they could succeed with. And uh, yeah, that's that's over now. Uh, they, they said they're going to keep this online for the foreseeable future, but there'll be no more updates. And it sounds like the Anthem team are going to be working on uh, Dragon Age 4. They're going to go and assist the Dragon Age team now. So, yeah, disappointing stuff for uh, for fans of Anthem, if they exist. <laughs> yeah, I, let's just apologize to that one or two people out there who are devastated by this news. It's, you know, this is pretty inevitable, pretty much from when the game launched. It was a it's just an absolute train wreck of a game which clearly struggled in development. There was no shortage of stories talking about the bizarre working conditions and the bizarre path to uh, being released that this game took. And yeah, it, it was a bad game. I, I don't really think an update could have saved it, if I'm honest with you. So it's probably for the best. You just move Bioware's resources off this, get them on Dragon Age 4, which will probably also be a bad game, but will at <laughs> least be confirmed this week that there will be no multiplayer component to this game. It yeah. will be single player only. And I think we can all agree, fan of Dragon Age or not, that is probably the correct way for that franchise to go. Oh, God, yeah. It's ludicrous to even... The fact they were even considering giving it a heavy multiplayer component is baffling to me. Like, I know that they, you know, with Anthem and, and with other games, they're trying to lean into this, you know, everything should be a game as a service kind of deal. But, I mean, Dragon Age is an RPG. Like, it's it's a traditional RPG. It's completely mad to think that you'd be trying to push a heavy multiplayer component. But, but yeah, look, I mean... I think it's fair to say they gave Anthem as good a shot as they could. It it had been hampered way too much before it even came out. I mean, there's been, as you said, there's been stories everywhere of the mismanagement and the lack of clear direction and the changing ideas in that in that studio leading up to it. So this is probably for the best. Let them let them focus those developers elsewhere. Uh, but I mean, spare a thought to us, who uh, are two people that do have to still complete Anthem for the sheet, <laughs> because, you know, now, now there's no hope that it will actually become a good game and we will just have to actually beat whatever the hell Anthem is left at now. So that's that's something. And also, you know, they said they keep it on for the foreseeable future, but there's probably a clock to that, right? If they're not going to update this game anymore, they're, they're not going to keep it online forever. So we probably should actually get to work on Anthem pretty soon. Oh, God, that's a nightmare situation. <laughs> I take it all back. Get back to work. <laughs> That's, that's fair. I, I, I'm on board with that. But uh, anyway, so moving on, uh, next story then is uh, we've heard this week that Sony are actually scaling back development at their Sony Japan studio. So this is a, a long-standing studio that have made games. Uh, they make games like Ape Escape, uh, Last Guardian on the PS3, and uh, the Gravity Rush games. Now, Sony seem to be suggesting that they're really going to heavily downscale development in Japan and all of their development in Japan at this point will be centered around Team Asobi, who are the developers of the fantastic uh, Astro Bot Rescue Mission PSVR game and the arguably even better Astro's Playroom uh, free game that comes on your PS5. So, I mean, that's a fantastic studio, but it still still sucks to see them winding down on Japanese development. You know, I mean, Sony are a Japanese company, but obviously most of their big hits at this point are Western games, you know, God of War, uh, Last of Us. So it's it does make some sense, but it's it's still definitely a shame. Yeah, this breaks my heart a little bit, if I'm honest with you. I love Japan Studio. I love the output of games they've done. It actually gave Sony more of a soul to me than, you yeah. know, they probably actually have, let's be honest. <laughs> but they, the games, like, I loved The Last Guardian. I think that sneaked into my honorable mentions for games of the generation. I yeah, thought that did, was yeah. a real 
good game. I also love the Gravity Rush games. I think mm, they're fantastic, same. and it's tragic they didn't get any form of audience. Ape Escape, they did Knack 2. I mean, <laughs> goddamn, Knack 2, yeah. man. Oh, Knack, it's, Knack it's is a, back, guys. Knack is back. It's a, real, yeah. it's a real shame, to be honest with you, though, because the Japanese market should still matter to Sony. The Japanese market is what gave them some of their biggest hits, is what gave them a lot of their personality, and it's, it's a real shame to see them move away from that. And to take a studio and move them. I mean, I know Astro's Playroom was a real good game and the Astro series is real good. But I, I'm just a little bit sad that we're potentially these franchises are lost to time now. And that's a real that's a real shame because there's a lot mm. of talent here and there's a lot of real good studios. And yeah, I kind of wish they didn't do this. This is a bit of a bit of a downer for me. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, so Astro's Playroom, for what it's worth, I I, I would make a real argument for that being my game of the year last year. I absolutely adored it. But one of the reasons Astro's Playroom works so well is because it's a celebration and a love letter to PlayStation's past. And, you know, they, there's going to be a limit on how, like, how effectively you can do that in the future if you're shutting up shop for your kind of famous like studios like the Sony Japan studio, you know, like I'm sure you'll still get all these big Western releases, but I, I do agree. Like I didn't even like the last guardian, frankly, I did love gravity rush, but even so I want those games to be getting made, you know, and it, it sounds like the issue here was basically that Sony wanted to pivot a lot of the developers over there into doing games with a kind of global first appeal. So they wanted, you know, wanted them to basically make games that were a bit more Western inspired. And it sounds like the studio, didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep targeting the Japanese market. So, you know, they reached an impasse and now here we are. And uh, I know recently over the last few months, the a lot of the like leads from things like Gravity Rush and Last Guardian have actually moved on. So maybe they saw the writing on the wall anyway, but it's still, it's sad news. It has to be. Yeah, let's hope that those devs who have decided to jump ship and any more who now may make the decision now it's being made for them do find themselves at good, lower-budget Japanese studios and keep pumping out the kind of weird titles that kind of always give Sony its quirky side. Mm. It's kind of always differentiated it from my, uh, for me from Microsoft, which is very Western-focused, and there's a reason it has no foothold in Japan, is because why the hell would you buy an Xbox console if you're Japanese? But the Sony brand still had that, and if they lose that, it'll be interesting to see where they go. It's a huge opportunity for Nintendo to... Uh, caught some of these smaller developers to perhaps say uh, this is the one true Japanese system left or better yet let's have a new Sega console <laughs> Dreamcast 2 starts now I mean don't forget Josh it's a hot market there's uh, there's still that Atari console coming out at some point so <laughs> you know can Sega really get in with, with Atari on the on the prowl but uh, it remains to be seen but anyway yeah as you said be great to see these uh, developers hopefully get into some other great Japanese studios and just keep pumping out those kinds of games you know it's what i think you know the world needs more games like that we have a ton of big western games so so yeah hopefully we see a lot more from those people and yeah just hopefully they find some good teams uh anyway okay then let's move on to the the heavy hitters for the week and we'll open this up with the playstation state of play event so this is one of your big you know playstation effectively nintendo direct for playstation for those who don't know about 50 minutes or 40 minutes this event was and the goal was yeah just to cover a lot of the big new stuff coming up which I mean, it has to be said, we'll we'll go through the games here. I I don't know. I don't know if they really succeeded in that goal. This was a, a bit of a bit of a weaker show than I expected. It's pretty lackluster. I mean, it's not helped by the fact that about 80% of the games they'd shown, they'd shown at other PlayStation state of play slash events in the yeah. past six months. At one point, I did think I'd accidentally put on an old <laughs> video and I had to double check I was watching the live stream of it, but yeah, it's, it's hardly a knockout city of a show, though it does feature knockout city, as I'm sure we'll get to. Right. Let's let's go through some of these games which they did announce, most of which we'd already heard of. Let's yeah. kick off Crash 4's getting a next-gen update. It's free, which is good, because mm -hmm. it's an Activision game, and Tony Hawk's is not free for its upgrade, which makes no sense to me. It's Crash 4. I've yet to play it. I do own it, so I might yeah. as well wait at this point to play it on my PS5. Yeah, no, that's fair. You know, it's doing the the stuff you like to hear from a PS5 update. You know, you, it's going to be using the uh, adaptive stuff on the controller, the haptics and stuff, which is good. It's got the 3D audio, should run at 4K60, all good stuff. Um, I don't like Crash 4. Um, that's 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 a big issue for me. I, I love the original <laughs> Crash trilogy, um, and I bought this the day it came out and played it over the, like, over two or three days instantly. And I, yeah, I kind of came out feeling like this was a, I don't know, like a five out of 10 game. I, I'm not a fan, sadly, but... 
I don't know if I'm, you know, I, I, I think I might be a bit of an outlier. I think it was received well. So, yeah, you know, always happy to see free updates to these games. I think especially for stuff that just came out. Like, I think, you know, mm. I think it's ludicrous charging £10 for a Tony Hawk's upgrade because these games basically came out in the window of the next-gen console. So, you know, you could argue that they should have been PS5 ready at launch. So to not be, and then six months later, be like, actually, I want another £10 off you, as they do with Tony Hawk's, is, is pretty outrageous. But yeah, at least Crash is free for whatever reason, despite the fact it's the same company. So that's something. That's something. We got more news on Returnal, which got a big gameplay trailer kind of showcasing a slightly more of a story bent to a game, which always mm. seemed like it'd be quite arcade heavy, as is the reputation of its developer's house mark. We also know it's now coming out on April the 30th. So only a few months time, but it is saddled with that £70 price tag, which will yeah. almost certainly hurt a new IP. What do you make of this game? I'm, I'm kind um, of in the middle on it. Every time I see Returnal, I want it less and less, to be honest. <laughs> um, my issue with this is that they clearly showed in this trailer, a trailer in which they, the narration of it suggested that they were showing us these bold new ideas in gaming that they've invented. But all they were doing were describing exactly how roguelikes work. Like they were just mm. describing a roguelike game, but they were like, oh, each time you play, the map is different and there'll be different enemies in different rooms. And on each run, there'll be power-ups and they won't be the same each time. And it's like, that's that's literally a roguelike. That's all this is. It's just a roguelike. And I don't know. I, I just, I, I was irritated by the fact that they seem to think it's something different. And also I cannot possibly get on board with the idea of a 70 pound roguelike. I mean... I don't mind these games. Like I, I've really enjoyed some of them. Dead Cells is fantastic. Uh, the Spelunky one and two are both great. Uh, End of the Gungeon. So, you know, fantastic roguelikes, but they're all lower priced indie games. So if you do buy them and you find yourself hitting a wall and you're frustrated by them, you don't feel too bad about the money you spent on them. Whereas I, I find the idea of me spending 70 pounds on a roguelike that I might just hate or hit a wall with and not want to play. That's just too risky of a proposition for me. Yeah, I mean, the, the big deal for me is it is a roguelike. I don't like the genre, even though I like the dev studio here. I love Next Machina, for example. I thought that was one of the best indie games of the last generation. But, you know, it, it may play well. It'll probably shoot pretty well. But as long as it's got that tag on it, I ain't going to pay more than 20, 30 quid for it. And I do fear that this game is just going to die in a ditch just mm. completely unloved by people. And it's a bit of a shame because I think there's nice ideas here. I appreciate the trying to go a bit more story-driven. I, I don't necessarily think that works, particularly with roguelikes. If you want to make a story-driven game, don't make it a roguelike. But, it's, you know, it's a very... make it like CDs. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. It's... The core yeah. of the actual gameplay loop. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sold on this at all. It's yeah, not sold I... on 70 pounds. I agree. I mean, I think it's got some interesting elements. They showed a strange kind of atmospheric horror twist to it this time where like, you know, you're exploring this planet and then all of a sudden the the lead character sees like her family home that maybe was a bit of a, a broken home that she grew up in. And, you know, she's kind of like, you know, quite rightly creeped out by the fact that's there and she goes in to explore it and stuff. And I wasn't expecting that from the game. I was expecting this to just be more straight up arcadey shooting stuff because that's what the gameplay is. So you know, they, they're definitely doing something interesting. I'm not completely selling it short just yet, but I'm concerned. And it just feels to me like at that price tag, it's not going to sell. And then it'll be like a a bumper PlayStation Plus title about six months later, you know? It'll be something like where, you know, maybe around the holiday season, it'll be like, oh, Returnal's free. And, you know, that that's a shame for Housemark. They're a, they're a talented studio. Absolutely. We got our second trailer in as many weeks for Knockout City. Yeah. Uh, bafflingly. This, this remains the exact same game I thought it was at the Nintendo Direct, which is pretty good idea. We'll probably not find an audience. Might yeah. as well not even bother getting excited about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this was mainly just telling you that there's a cross-play beta coming out very soon. So if you do want to check out Knockout City, which is this kind of dodgeball-inspired um, like shooting game, effectively... Uh, you know, check it out. There's a beta coming up. And I mean, it's a cross-play beta, which, you know, Sony are typically a bit hit and miss with allowing cross-play. So obviously they're they're allowing it this time, which is, is always good. But yeah, I, I if, if there's an Xbox show next week and they show Knockout City, I'm I'm just I'm just taking my ball and going <laughs> home. I'm just done. I can't I'm just, I'm just over it. Next title up was a new announcement, which is Sifu. Uh 2021, this game will be coming out. It seems to be a 2D brawler. 
almost representing the old fights from movies. It seems to be taking mm. influences from the great action scenes of our time. It actually looked kind of cool, but the problem is it's developed by the team behind Absolver, and I hate Absolver. And so yeah. this game is an instant nope for me unless it comes out to rave reviews. Or it comes to Game Pass and you have to play it. <laughs> or it comes, as is the yeah. want of everything else. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, look, I mean, I thought this was a really cool trailer. Um, as you said, it's really going into those kind of movie-inspired fight scenes. It's got some cool trailer stuff of like them fighting in a hallway and like in a sort of kitchen type area and he jumps over the table to get some space from some of the enemies so he can take out some of the other ones. It all looks cool. It, it is definitely, it's talking a good game from this trailer, I think, but I am very concerned by it being a slow clap game. I, I thought Absolver missed the mark on almost every level and I hope this is better. Uh, I really do. I, I, I will definitely give it a look and I'll keep an eye on reviews because I thought the trailer looked cool and probably they've got this really weird hook to it where you start off as like a young martial artist and when you die, you basically just become older and then get back up. And when you get back up and you're older, you're now more skilled. It's like you've got more experience in fighting and combat and you're stronger. So you kind of, yeah, as you go through the game, you'll just become more old and decrepit, but you'll also kick a lot more ass. So I quite like that. I wonder where the end of that is. Like, do can I become too old and then I suck? Or am I just constantly becoming even better? Like, you know, it, is it going to be like a point of pride in this game to get to the end of the game looking like a baby still because you haven't died? Like, you know, there's it's a cool hook. I like it. I think it's it's clever and, and creative and you never know, you know, if, if they keep the kind of the scope of this down a bit compared to Absolver, because Absolver, they tried to make this big open world, almost like a Dark Souls map that just didn't work. Like, if they keep this focused on, like, level-to-level -level stuff and, you know, they make a, a set, like, a set series of combos and moves you can do, because, again, Absolver let you edit, like, every single punch to be whatever you wanted it to be, and it was too much. If they scale this down, I, I do think this could be quite cool. It, it has potential, I, I will admit, and if it does let me start as a baby... I, I would absolutely love that. <laughs> the, the enemies just come in and just kick the shit out of this baby. And like, well, obviously I can't fight. I'm a baby. What the hell? That's what I want. I just, I just want somebody coming out after a baby with a hammer. And, just, just like, oh, and you, oh, you he, can you just got a button to shit your pants. That's literally all you can do. <laughs> Oh yeah, that sounds fantastic. But yeah, if they do that, I'm, I'm buying it. It's great. Yeah, day one purchase. Ooh. Okay, next one, Solar Ash 2021. This is the next game from the Hyperlight Drifter team. And mm. it's a 3D platform, is what they described it as. I don't know. I've seen a couple of trailers for this now, man, and I don't particularly get that excited for it. Maybe yeah. I've just hit a wall with this type of indie game. And I need something else to get me excited about. Like Neon White had its fast place card based kind of you know, gameplay yeah. going on. This game just looks like the generic 3D indie platform I've played about 100 million times at this point. Yeah, no, I kind of agree. You know, I, the, the developer, uh, the, you know, Hyperlight Drifter was a really well-received game. Uh, it's been published by Annapurna, who we always say just constantly pump out hits every time. So it's got a lot of pedigree there that should be good. But I look at the gameplay for this and it's just like, it just kind of feels like it's like, well, we're, we're making another game that's a bit like you move around like it's Journey, but then there's more platforming. I, I just, I don't know. It just looked a bit, It like everything about it looks kind of good, right? But then the overall package, I'm just so disinterested in it. I think that's the best I can kind of say for it. Like it didn't do anything wrong, but I'm also just a bit over playing these games. Like I just, I don't know. It just didn't, didn't do anything for me. Yeah, I can't say I'm massively excited for it. The next game announced was Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, talking about things I have no interest in. <laughs> I, I just, I couldn't care less. Absolutely could not care less about this series. It's the genre which we currently have does very little for me, means very little to me. It seems to be trying to go away from its traditional camera gameplay. It's kind of teasing. It might be a little bit more move yeah. around the map, which might make it more interesting. But these are kind of fundamentally bad games, so I don't really trust mm. them to be adding more game elements. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's going to help. I mean, that was the interesting thing with this, though, right? Because we've uh, we've touched on the the early Five Nights at Freddy's games, the kind of ones that, you know, you sit in a room and you turn the cameras on or off and you have to keep enough power so that the animatronics don't kill you. And, like, they're, they're hot garbage. Like, they are genuinely, absolutely dreadful games. I I can't be bothered even... They're quite quick completions. And I still can't be bothered going to finish them for our challenge yet. I'm going to wait till later and stuff. Like... They, they, they suck, but they've got a weird charm in that, right? That's the whole point. They're kind of meant to be trash games. Whereas this looks like it's trying to be a real game. Like this was showing this was showing someone going around a 
reasonably large open area in a 3D, like first person camera, 3D world, like walking around this creepy kind of, I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't quite just like a restaurant, was it? It was a bigger place. It was almost like a little kind of play parky kind of area as well. And it looks like it's doing more, but I don't know if I want more, you know, like it, it, it might not be as bad as the other games is about the best I can say. Um, if you'd showed me this trailer without me knowing it's Five Nights at Freddy's, I might have actually been like, that looks interesting. I'll give it a look. But because of the pedigree of the series, I just, I don't know. I feel like once we see more of it, I'm going to end up disappointed. You just know the first gameplay trailer is just going to be you behind a door, just pushing yeah. a button. And it's all just going to be for a stupid trailer. It'll just be. The next game announced was so- Oddworld Soulstorm, which I swear I've seen about 700 trailers of. <laughs> I think I've seen trailers of this in my sleep. At this point, I guess the big announcement here is this is coming April 6th, so it's not Vaporware, which I always kind of assumed it would be. And moreover, it's free for PlayStation Plus members, so Mm. I can download it, even though I have absolutely no interest in actually playing it. Yeah, so Oddworld Soulstorm, this is obviously the sequel to Oddworld New and Tasty, which came out forever ago now. I think it was a 2015 game, maybe 2016. So it's been a long time. Um, this thing has been in development hell, really, for a long, long time. Uh, there's been, it's been kind of re revealed about four times, as in, you know, it's a new game they're showing us each time. It's not a case of they just keep reminding us they're making it. They've literally thrown this thing out and started it up again over and over. And, you know, it's good to see that they've finally settled on something. But I got to be honest, I mean, watching this trailer, and it had it had bright spots. Like, I think the environments in particular look look fantastic. It looked lovely. Um, but the gameplay is just more Oddworld. It's just, it's exactly the same as New and Tasty because it's a sequel and it kind of should be. Uh, the only thing I saw that they added was crafting, which I, I hate crafting. You know, I, I, I don't know why you've spent six years on on a sequel to this game to give me the same game but now there's crafting you know that's that's really really disappointing um i'll probably play this i i was hoping to play it about three years ago so I, i'll try and dig up some of that hype I had then and uh you know get on this one and it's especially made easier by the fact it's going to be free on ps plus but but yeah I, I i just think it's a bit of a disappointment after all of that time that it just looks like it's odd world plus i can now build some stuff with parts yeah, I mean, you know, this is Oddworld. I'm not a huge fan of this franchise. I've never really cared for it. Most people's affinity from it comes from Abe's Odyssey because it was yeah. one of the few games you could play on PlayStation at the time. And everybody <laughs> seems to have a copy of it, and it was on every demo disc. And that's where most people's love of this franchise comes from. And I don't know if I, I enjoyed it back then, and now I, I just don't want to play it. So it's definitely not one for me, but I might give it a go since I'll be getting it for now. So that is at least something. Mm-hmm. I guess the, the other game they now say was Keener Bridge of Spirits, which is coming on August 24th. Now, I think this looks gorgeous and yeah. I hope it's good. But yeah, it was a very nagging past me that just feels this is going to be a little bit basic. Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? Because this is uh, this is developed by Ember Lab, and this is their first actual game. Uh, they've they've been a studio for a while, but I imagine they must have been doing kind of, you know, assisting others with development or something. I don't know that for sure, but I know that they've been around for about a decade, and yet this is their first game. So, you know, they, they I mean, it looks great. You are right. This has a beautiful kind of Pixar looking style to it. It looks gorgeous. The environments look so like beautiful, vibrant, colorful. Uh, they showed some glimpses of combat in this, and the combat looked. Looked pretty great. It looked like uh, kind of like Dark Soulsy, but don't I don't mean that as in the difficulty of Dark Souls, just the flow of the combat. You know, it's it looked like it was all about finding a window to get your attacks in. You know, dodging around them and, and blocking at the right time, stuff like that. And it looked good. Um, I have the same issue you know, though. You know, like because we have nothing to go on from the studio, and all we've seen is a, the odd kind of couple of minutes trailer that does look great. I kind of need to see some some real proof for this one, you know, that it's going to be what it looks like it's going to be because we have nothing to go on. So, yeah, I mean, if this ends up being the game it looks like, I will be very excited to pick this up on, on uh, August 24th. I'll, I'll be real excited for that. But, yeah, just just got to gotta keep my, my expectations in check, I think, for this one. Yeah, keeping them in check. The price point's nice to see. It's launched at £33 over here in the UK, and I think it's $40 in the yeah. States. So it's coming in at a budget-ish kind of price which is nice yeah I, I live in hope i just this looks like the kind of game which is going to get slapped with a load of six or sevens out of ten and mm. that that's okay because those games are not bad they're actually quite playable and maybe i'll quite enjoy it but 
I just don't expect great things from it. A game I do expect great things from, though, is Deathloop, which yeah. has given, yes, another <laughs> trailer. Uh, but as another announced of its release, it's coming on 21st of May. So hmm. Deathloop still looks great. Deathloop still looks absolutely fantastic. Arcane Studios, good idea, good hook. But what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, I mean, you know, Deathloop goes... I said earlier with Returnal, every time I see it, I want it less and less. Deathloop goes the other way. Every trailer they show, this game looks better. I mean, I remember the early trailers where I thought it looked cool, but I just didn't get what the hell the game was. And, like, now they've really established what it is. And this trailer just went full kind of bombastic. Like, here's a James Bond... He's like a custom Deathloop, James Bond-style intro music video. And it was, yeah, it's an awesome trailer. The game looks fantastic. I mean, Arcane are... It's, I, I, there's a real argument to be made to say that Arcane are the most consistent game studio. Like every game they make is kind of, at the very least, I would probably put them at an eight. You could argue a seven maybe, but like Dishonored, Prey, they just, they make hits every time. And this looks like it's going to follow that pattern. So I'm really excited for it. I just, I just hope it sells because that's been Arcane's main problem. Like the Dishonored games, Dishonored 2 in particular, is a stunning, stunning video game, but not enough people bought it. So yeah, really hope this this picks up some sales because it does deserve them by the looks of it. Yeah, hoping it picks up sales. Looking forward to hearing first hands-on feedback from this because the ideas sound good, but there's that nagging worry in my head that it could be quite frustrating. Mm. But I, I'm yeah. living in hope because I just think it looks great and the studio's great, so in theory, this should be fine. And the big announcement of the show, probably the only big scoop they had, let's be honest, yeah. was that Final Fantasy VII Remake is getting a free PS5 update for those who own the PS4 console game. And moreover, a new episode is coming as well, episode Yuffie. This all kind of starts on June 10th. So it's pretty soon, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, coming pretty soon. Uh, what do you make of this? There's a, there's a lot to unpack here because there's a lot of provisos to all mm. these things which they are offering. Yeah, this has been a messy setup. I mean, first of all, it's tricky when you kind of, you know, these conferences, whether it's Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, they always like to end with the big kind of, oh, and one more thing. And then they show you like the big thing they're excited about. And it remains to be seen if this is really a big enough thing to be that package for this this conference. You know, like Final Fantasy VII Remake is a huge game. Of course it is. Final Fantasy VII itself is one of the biggest games of all time. But this is just a PlayStation 5 update for it. And also a DLC pack, which, you know, could be good, but also might be a bit trivial. You know, there's no way of knowing yet. So, I mean, first of all, let's go with the update itself. This is this looks like some good stuff. Uh, they showed a bunch of side-by-sides of the graphics updates, and it, it, looks, it looks like a good update. I mean, the PS4 one already looked fantastic, which is almost holding back how impressive the update is. You know, like, when you look at the screen side-by-side, side, the PS5 one does look substantially better, but it already looked great anyway. So, you know... It's not required, I think, to get the update to play this game. Uh, loading improvements are coming, which is always great. It's got a photo mode, which, you know, I mean, photo modes are really cool. Um, I like what other people do with photo modes. I tend to not have the energy to really dig into them too much. Um, I imagine people are going to use this photo mode to be real thirsty. Um, that's that's <laughs> going to be the primary use of the Final Fantasy VII Remake photo mode. Uh, I think there'll be... Be a lot of uh, a lot of tea for in that dress. Uh, will be over the internet when this, when this uh, this comes out. But but nonetheless, look, good update. Happy it's free. Um, but yeah, things just get a bit messy because, as you said, right, you've got first of all the original game is coming to PlayStation Plus in March. So Final Fantasy VII Remake for PS4 that's coming to PlayStation Plus in March. But that version can't be upgraded to the PS5. So if you get the free PS Plus version and you want the PS5 content, you have to buy the game the full price game and to make that an extra level of awkward the episode yuffie content they're making now is ps5 exclusive so that's playstation 5 exclusive dlc for a playstation 4 game which that stings on a few levels i think that that stings if you're someone who got it free in ps plus and you just like to give over 10 or 15 dollars to play episode yuffie because you you can't you have to first pay the PS5, you have to buy the full game to get the PS5 version. Uh, it stings if you're someone who still can't find a PS5 in June, which could be a real problem. We don't know for sure yet if they're going to be, you know, on store shelves by then. It's It's been rough going so far and we're four months after launch. So that could be a real problem. You know, you might literally, the FF7 Remake might be your favorite game of the last generation. You might own a copy 
and new content will come out and you literally can't buy the console to play it. So, you know, there's there's some tricky bits here. I mean, I I love the look of the game. I, I'm really excited to play Remake when I get around to it because I'm I'm now 15 hours into the original 7 and when I ever I see content on 7 Remake, I just get real excited now, which is cool. But I don't know, this 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 reveal had enough highs and lows to come out a bit a bit in the middle, you know? Yeah, it's a real tricky one. I mean, FF7 Remake, one of my favorite game of last year, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It's a real good game. As mentioned, the PS4 version looks so damn good. The PS5 update isn't necessarily essential stuff. It looks real nice. I always felt like FF7R was kind of a game which should have come out on the PS5. It's, it's so close to what a perfect PS5 game would be. Yeah. And that combat in 60 frames is going to be real nice, like mm. real good. So I'm really looking forward to just jumping back into it. But as mentioned, those the episode Yuffie stuff is probably where I get most annoyed. Not even annoyed, but it is very frustrating if you're a PS4 player who loved this game that you're not going to be able to play a fairly substantial bit of side content about one of the most popular characters in the game. Everybody loves Yuffie. She's great. And so it was really exciting when she turned up here. And if you don't, can't get a PS5, and as you say, many people can't, you're not going to be able to play it. Conversely, it's possibly the first time I felt real good about having a PlayStation 5. <laughs> I'll tell kind you that of, one. Yeah, kind of the same, to be honest. Uh, there is <laughs> All that. of a sudden, I feel, yeah, damn good I've got this bit. I can finally play something I really want to play on it. So that's mm. cool. Yeah. Uh, the PS Plus upgrade, I, I stand on this side of, well, it's it's a free game in Plus. You get 40-odd games a year. You know, if, if you love it that much, just buy a PS4 copy. You can buy them now for £15. You yeah, know, if you like it that much, why wouldn't you want to just own it yourself anyway? So, you know, I, I'm not too fussed on that point. But yeah, it's, it's a weird one, isn't it? It's, it looks real good. I'm looking forward to playing it. But that Yuffie stuff is it's a little bit skeevy. I really yeah, it's feel all... they could have made that for PS4 too. Yeah, it's all just a bit messy, isn't it? That's the only problem. And I mean, you know, it, it also it remains to be seen what episode Yuffie's even going to be. You know, mm. it, it could be a substantial piece of content. It could be a one and a half hour thing. I mean... All of the DLC for Final Fantasy 15, which you know is the nearest Final Fantasy game in in release order to this one, was decent, but took about 90 minutes to beat. So yeah. I don't know, you know, how substantial will this be? I mean, from a story perspective, obviously not to go too deep into any sort of story spoilers, but this is Yuffie appearing earlier than you would see her in the original Final Fantasy 7. So that either means that this could be a really cool bit of backstory of something she does before she meets the team, or it could be just a frivolous piece of content that they made for the sake of it. You know, we just don't know yet, but I'm optimistic. I, I hope it'll be good. Uh, I'm looking forward to playing it. I mean, I'm going to delay my Final Fantasy VII Remake playthrough until June the 10th now, because why would I start the PS4 version? But but yeah, you know, hopefully it'll turn out well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the end of the, the state of play news, really. I, I do want to, while we're in the world of FF7, I do want to touch on a couple of weird, weird announcements that they made about Final Fantasy VII after the state of play, because it wasn't to do with PlayStation, though. So just quickly on these ones, they announced two new Final Fantasy VII games. So we've gone from people clamoring for a Final Fantasy VII remake for about 20 years to them suddenly going, here's everything about FF7 ever all at once. Um, but yeah, so starting this out, there is a game coming out for mobile this year called Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, which is a battle royale because, of course, it is. Um, apparently, this is going to be set before the events of Final Fantasy VII, and you have a big battle royale to decide who's going to be the first ever soldier or some nonsense. Um, it looks good. I mean, in, you know, purely from a visuals and a kind of brief look at the gameplay, it looked... It looks solid. It looks fun. Um, I don't need a battle royale to exist about Final Fantasy VII. And also, I don't need this to be... If you really must make it, I don't know why you made it mobile only. It would be my my two takeaways from this one. I don't know if you have anything to say on this. Yeah, I mean, the minute it's mobile only, my interest just disappears. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a cash grab for the mobile audience. Maybe yeah. it'll be good, but no one's going to really care. It's not going to offer anything substantial. I think the more interesting one is... Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis, which yes. which by all accounts is combining every space of Final Fantasy VII content we've ever had, be it Final Fantasy VII itself, Advent Children, Before Crisis, Crisis Core, and Dirge of Cerberus into one completely playable package. But yeah. again, it's all on mobile, which is real strange. <laughs> Let me just yeah, say. I mean... 
this one kind of I find this one really really weird as well. And I I don't know how you feel because I mean you're well you're you're more into the Final Fantasy VII universe I guess than I am at this point. You know you've played the original fully and you've played the remake fully. So what I struggle with with this one is so this is basically they're going to remake all of those different things. You know some of those are like movies. Advent Children was a movie. Dirge of Cerberus was like a shooting game, effectively. You know, they're, yes. they're basically smashing all of these things into the original Final Fantasy VII PlayStation 1 style of gameplay, um, where, yeah, it all looks very similar, actually, to the PlayStation 1 until you get into a battle, and then then the character models look like the seven remake characters, which that kind of tracks with how FF7 originally was. It, it had a totally different models for battles. But what I find weird is this is going to be a complete definitive telling of all of the Final Fantasy VII story and content. And that's going to come out in 2022 while everyone waits for Remake Part 2. And I don't know, like I, I I, haven't played Remake yet. You might have to fill in a few blanks from here, but I kind of got the impression that Remake was going to not completely change up the story, but definitely make a few tweaks and, you know, tweaks and alterations here and there to kind of, you know, change it in ways they wanted to or maybe keep the fans on their toes a bit. And I, I don't know if it damages that a bit by just being like, here's literally all of the real story that's coming out for you to play before we get through the rest of the remake games. I I don't know. Do you, do you feel like that? Or do you think because it's mobile only, it's kind of separate enough anyway that it doesn't matter? I think in many ways, this is kind of what fans, a lot of fans wanted from the remake, which is just mm. a straight retelling with some slightly spruced up graphics. The battle scenes in particular look pretty cool telling all the story, printing all the disparate elements together into one package. A lot of fans just wanted this from Remake. Remake is a little bit more subversive than that. It's doing different things with the story. At least it's teasing it will do, whether it does or not. Who the heck knows? They'll never mm. release that second part. It'll never <laughs> come out. But, you know, this, this is an interesting thing. But the fact it is on mobile, just and the fact that some of these games are very disparate types of gameplay. I don't quite know how you smash Dirge of Cerberus into this gameplay, yeah. but not very that weird. Uh, you know, yeah, by all means, good luck. And I guess it's cheaper than trying to find a copy of Crisis Core anymore. I mean, God help <laughs> you trying to find a cheap copy of that. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, I think this stuff's primarily going for the Japanese market anyway. You know, they they're big on their mobile gaming and stuff, and you know, it's it's probably for them more than than the Western market, but. Yeah, I don't know. Just came off a bit odd to me. Um, but yeah, anyway, so next up we have the Pokemon Direct, which was, uh, you know, effectively another showcase, 30-minute showcase just on Pokemon this time to celebrate the anniversary of Pokemon, which is uh, turned 25 this week. It was 25, 25 right? 25 years old. Yeah, big old, big old thing there. But um, but yeah, I mean, I've I've been playing Pokemon that whole time, so quite cool to see it reach that that anniversary um, total. But got to say, this, this thing opened up with a an eight minute montage, which was showing everything that Pokemon has ever been. And it was like a kind of set to like a bit of music and they'd show everything from like the original games to like the anime that's been made to like obscure stuff. Like, uh, you know, the fact that there was a typing game on the DS where you could learn typing with Pikachu, you know, they, they went through all this stuff. And I think it's really cool that they showed off all the wacky stuff that Pokemon has done over the years. But I was so angry by this opening intro thing. It just like, because they just kept shouting the same words. Like they just, if they wanted to tell you that they they made a link cable work, that they just go cable, 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 cable. And I was like, what, what is this? You know, I, I kind of showed up to this expecting big reveals of the new Pokemon games, which we did get. But first we got eight minutes of someone going anime, cable, cable, typing, cable. And I was like, what? No. So yeah, I am... Um, <laughs> I, I hated that a lot. And I know that, yeah, I know we've talked about this and and you think it just makes me a big old stupid corpse, man. But uh, and that might be right. But yeah. yeah you, are, a... you have officially crossed the line into just old man. You've played <sighs> too much Beat the Sheet. It's killed you, man. I thought it was sweet. It was fun. It was nice to see all the cool little weird stuff with the funny music in the background. I liked how they kept shouting cable. At me. I should have muted it. If I would have <laughs> muted it, I might have liked it because I like all the other stuff. I just hated that he kept shouting cable at me. I don't want to stop it. That's, that's enough it's, now. Like I said, just just be grateful it wasn't that Post Malone song just stretched <laughs> out for eight minutes. That's, that's what I say. <laughs> oh, I mean, they announced today that uh, they're making a Pokemon uh, 25th anniversary album which will have what sounds like multiple songs from Post Malone on it. So more of that's oh there God. for you if you want it. So, uh, yeah, it can be a I will sad listen day when to... I listen to that. Yeah, it's gonna yeah. I, I will listen to it. And then I'll long for the days that I was listening to the word cable eight minutes in a row. But uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, anyway, let's get to the big stuff here. We've got uh, 
got a couple of big games to cover here. So first big announcement here was remakes of the Generation 4 Pokemon games, which were Diamond and Pearl. They were the first games to come to the Nintendo DS. And yeah, we're getting the uh, end of this year. We're getting Brilliant Diamond, uh, Brilliant Diamond, sorry, and Shining Pearl, which are what look to be very, very traditional remakes. It has to be said. These are, these are not Let's Go games that have changed mechanics. And they are certainly not in the visual style of the more modern games. These these look like they're trying their best to ape how the DS games looked, but in a kind of 3D space. Yeah, it's just a chibi art style, isn't it? Which yeah. will really annoy some people. I don't mind it. I, I remember looking at it at first and thinking, eh, it's a little bit ugly, but it's grown on me the more I look at it. I will say the only real... I mean, Diamond and Pearl, the pixel art on those games is real good. The yeah. pixel art on the DS games in general is lovely. So it's not necessarily something that needed a great graphical update. So if you're going to do it, do it in a slightly different style, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's kind of got that Link's Awakening kind of remake vibe to it. Just a bit less, you know, really leaning into it, a little bit more careful. I don't know. It's real expensive to buy these games used. Diamond and Pearl costs about £40 used now, inexplicably, considering it sold millions of copies. I've never (laughs) understood how this game is still so pricey. So if you want a new way to buy and play this game, this is probably a good way to do it. It's a faithful remake. Diamond and Pearl were pretty decent games. There's never really been a bad Pokemon game. They're pretty much the same game. They've nailed the formula with the first title and they've just been iterating on it since, let's be honest. So, yeah, I, I yeah. think it looks fine if you want to play Diamond and Pearl again. Knock yourself out. Here it is. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. You know, it's. Uh, I was definitely taken aback by the change in style because, you know, when you've got Sword and Shield and the Let's Go games, you've kind of already got two different, like, different spins on the Pokemon art style. It's weird that a third one would also exist. You know, it's kind of like, yeah. surely you'd pick one of those. But, yeah, you know, I mean, it looks like a traditional, like, straight-up remake, which I think is good. You know, I, I'd rather have this than than another Let's Go game, to be honest. I, you know, I feel like people who want to replay these Pokemon games want to replay them. They don't want to play a weird thing where you don't actually fight. You just throw a ball 100 times at the Pokemon. You know, they've got Pokemon Go for that. So I just, yeah, I think this is the right attitude with that stuff. Um, and this has actually been developed by the team who made Pokemon Home, which is the app that lets you transfer Pokemon between your like switch and other devices, I think. So these, Mm. these guys haven't necessarily made a game yet, but they, you know, they're obviously in, they're in house over at the Pokemon company. They've got a ton of people overseeing them and, you know, it looks, it looks like it's going to be good. So I think it's good as well that they've, you know, kind of outsourced this, you know, it leaves game freak to work on potentially bigger things, which we will get to. So yeah, no, I've I've got nothing bad to say about this. Um, I think it's good timing as well. The, The, you know, the DS games came out, long enough ago now that the kind of era of people who started with those games are getting to their kind of like late teens, early twenties. Yeah. So that's a great time to bring a remake out. You know, you really hit that childhood nostalgia for that group of people. Um, you know, they kind of did the same thing with gold and silver back in the day when they released those on, on the DS because, you know, they'd, yeah, they, they did the same thing there and they should do it more. It's, it's the right way to do it. So yeah, happy with that. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's move on to the, the main event here then, which is, uh, they announced that Game Freak themselves are working on a new game called Pokemon Legends Arceus. I believe that's how you say it. Who really knows? Uh, but yeah, so this is, I mean, realistically, this looks like they're, they're trying to do it, Josh. They're, they're trying to do the open world Pokemon game that everyone's wanted forever. Well, we've been apparently demanded. I've never demanded an open world Pokemon game. Let me let me state on the record, I was happy for them to make the same game over and over <laughs> again because I loved that same game. But here it is. It takes the open wild areas from Sword and Shield and turns it into a full game. I don't know. I thought it looked pretty cool. I think it. I like the idea that you could stealthily sneak up a Pokemon and just ram a Pokeball up its ass and catch it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. You may not necessarily do that, quick disclaimer. Yeah, but yeah, no, yeah. I, 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 I kind of think it looks cool. I like how it's set in an old, ye olde time. Yeah, it's the past. That's cool. And that's that's kind of cool. Like kind of like that. So yeah, maybe, maybe this could work. It, it looks a little bit on the uh, janky side, but mm. it's a game in- free game. Incredibly janky. I mean, I would say that I, so I came out of this very negative on it um, because, because of how janky it looked. I mean, it looked rough. There was some Pokemon that literally had missing frames of animation. They just were going from like one animation to the next without any real connection. And it was obviously a mess. And I, I was pretty down on it, but then I kind of realized the next day, 
that I was just still pissed off at that eight-minute intro video. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think I came back the next day and I was like, hang on, actually, this is, if I don't look at the jankiness, because this is a game that's coming out in 2022. It's not even any time soon. If I don't look at that, again, as I said, people have been clamoring for Pokemon to go more open world. They, they you know, whether or not you want that from the games themselves, there's no denying it's an incredibly natural fit for the the like the franchise, right? You know, the, you walk around in open fields and catch monsters. It just fits. And this could be something really, really special. And I, I'm i actually quite optimistic. I think at the worst, this will be good. And, you know, there's a, there's a chance that they might pull it out the bag and it could be something really special. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with this. I think this is cool. Um, there's also, there's, there's some rumblings actually, because this is set in the same region as um, Diamond and Pearl, apparently. And, the legendaries in that world are um, Palkia and Dialga, and they control space and time. So people are starting to say, like, what if we don't spend the whole game in the past? You know, if if if, if this world has legendaries that change time and stuff, like, what if what if you actually have different eras that you end up in and stuff? And that could be awesome. I, I'd, I'd be on board for that too. Uh, I like the historical setting, but you know, as long as that's there, you you do whatever you want with it. It's, uh, I you know, guarantee you that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> We can't do it that, Jesus Christ. But my my main takeaway from your entire argument was there was that you were so angry about this Pokemon game. I want to know what else you did after that with this rage just hold up inside. Did you like quit your job, go <laughs> onto the street and like punch somebody, break up with your girlfriend, and then just wake up the next day and go, cable and just go, Oh god, I what did I do? <laughs> just, 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 uh, you are I think a major um... Uh, <laughs> could be a potentially niche reference here but did you ever watch uh did you ever watch the sinner on netflix no Ah, <laughs> uh, the sinner is a show where there's um uh it's a bit spoilery anyway but someone does an atrocious crime because some music plays and it rem- it reminds them of something in the past and like i can imagine that happening to me like 30 years time i'm just i'm just sat having a nice day and i just see a cable cable and all of a sudden i'm in jail and i've murdered 10 people with a cable and it's just i've just gone full hit man on them and just yeah i just i i was it was mad it really was because i was genuinely so sure at the end of that that conference that i thought it sucked and then then and then like later in the day i was like but they announced a Pokemon remake and a new potentially open world Pokemon game. That's obviously great. Like, what? The, why, why were you so grumpy about the intro? It's just, just ridiculous. Yeah, very much uh, old man yells at Cloud energy coming from me there. I just, yeah, my my apologies, Pokemon. It was actually quite a cool show. But yeah, anyway, on that grumpy, grumpy note, that is the end of this edition of Beat the Sheet. So in the meantime, if you'd like to catch us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Beat the Sheet. As always, that's a great place to get the latest info on games coming to Game Pass and leaving Game Pass. We uh, we always post about them there as soon as we know. Uh, if you want to drop us an email, feel free to catch us at beattheshippodcast at gmail.com. Always happy to, uh, to hear from our fans on there. That'd be great. And uh, yeah, so until next time, I am Andy Wood, and uh, I've now completed sixty-seven percent of the sheet. I have uh, I've clawed up two percent this week from from all the sports and uh, all the garbage games I played to get to three hundred. So been a good week. And I'm Josh Jameson, and I've gained a percentage point to fifty-seven percent, which not too bad when you consider I've basically just played Persona Five Strikers <laughs> all week. So we'll take that. We'll take that as a small, small victory. Well, you know, who's had the better week, really, Josh? You playing Persona 5 Strikers or me playing Heavy Weapon, Dead Space, Ignition, and Russia Disney Pixar Adventure? Uh, it's you, isn't it? That's that's what it is. It's definitely you. Just doesn't even need an answer. Uh, well, anyway, thanks a lot for listening this week, guys, and we will see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>